and welcome to the Master of Educational Technology program at UBC's podcast for our anti-racism speaker series. My name is Dr. Carrie Ewart and I am a faculty member for the Master of Educational Technology program, what we call MET at UBC and the EDIDA coordinator and designer of the anti-racism speaker series. I would also like to introduce our EDIDA graduate academic assistant, Tomika Fisher. For our listeners, one of the ways that we begin meetings in Canada is to acknowledge the Indigenous people on who's taken land from which we benefit. This is a part of a broader national truth and reconciliation effort in Canada and at UBC. I am speaking for, on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam peoples. Our podcasting booth, MET offices and servers are located on this territory. A more expansive statement on our commitment to Canada's 94 calls to action can be found on our MET website as the statement on commemorating Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. These calls to action invite us to commit to changes. MET has launched a series of podcasts that will explore the role of education and technology in social justice in anti-racism as part of this call. Tomika, would you like to share your territorial acknowledgement? Thanks, Carrie. I'm an uninvited settler and respectfully acknowledge that I'm communicating from the ancestral, traditional, and stolen territories of the Kwantlen and Katsi First Nations and the Coast Salish peoples. I'm grateful to my hosts for the privilege of studying, living, working, and recreating in this life-giving place and thank them for their stewardship. I recognize my responsibility to take action to reduce the racism, oppression, and harms Indigenous peoples experience and work towards reconciliation. Carrie? You, Tamika. Now, what is the Master of Educational Technology Program, or MET? It is a program that educates professionals on the use and the impact of digital learning technologies. This fully online graduate program provides a unique opportunity for our students to engage in topics such as the roles of ed tech in racism and anti-racism. Since the degree program launched in 2002, close to 2,000 individuals have enrolled in the UBC MET program with more than 450 students enrolled currently. MET dedicates itself to supporting its learners, stakeholders, and the public to make a more positive change in communities. What is the speaker series about and what are we talking about in this podcast? The purpose of this speaker series is to acknowledge the commitment that every individual has to inclusivity and to addressing systemic racism. With a focus on anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, and anti-People of Colour racism, this series seeks to identify the responsibility educators and leaders have to facilitating and supporting anti-racist approaches and strategies within their practice to enhance and transform learning environments and learning cultures. With a specific directive being digital technologies, Presenters and guests will discuss racism and tools to support equity, diversity, and inclusivity and the changing dynamics of the digital age. As a result, at MET, we are committed to follow up each presentation of this speaker series with a call to action challenge. We invite listeners to make one change this month, no matter how small, and share it with us as a next step to this podcast to eradicate racism through community building education, and through the use of educational technologies. This call to action provides you the opportunity as listeners of this podcast to build on the anti-racist content from the session and make steps towards change. For example, you might integrate what you've heard and thought about from this podcast with a lesson plan that will bring awareness to the issues of racism for students, colleagues, and friends. We will provide you with more details about this call for proposals at the end of the podcast. Thank you, Tamika. The topic for today's podcast is Teaching Transformatively, Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy. On the show, we have three recent MET graduates, Annika Newsbaum, Angela Reynolds, and Chris Rugo. I would love for each of you to take a moment to briefly introduce yourselves and say a little bit about the educational work you are doing in anti-racism in two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, and other identities, or what is referred to as 2SLGBTQIA plus communities, and from where do you get your personal drive? Annika? Hi, Carrie. Uh, thank you so much 
I'm Annika, my pronouns are she, her, and I grew up on the Opasquiat Cree Nation in Northern Manitoba. And I now live, learn, and teach on the ancestral unceded lands of the Hulkaminam speaking people of the Kuwitsin and Malahat. I've been teaching high school humanities and media studies for the past 20 years in Manitoba and BC. I'm currently an educator and SOGI lead in the Couch and Valley School District and sessional instructor at VIU. And I've been working with 2SLGBTQIA plus youth since I began teaching high school in 2004. In the first year of my career, a group of students and I created a GSA in our school to shift the culture and spread awareness of the importance of allyship and how to be an upstander. For three years, we ran a season for nonviolence campaign to engage the student body in anti-hate action and reflection between January 30th and April 4th to solemnly mark the assassinations of Mahatmas Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Leading up to the GLSEN's Day of Silence to recognize and protest the harassment, bullying and discrimination, in effect, the silencing that many students face in schools. I've continued this work here in BC as a SOGI lead in various schools in the Valley, facilitating GSAs and rainbow clubs. Youth activism is important, and these clubs and campaigns are effective ways for queer and ally youth to connect, spread awareness, and make a positive change in their school and community culture. At the same time, it's important for all youth to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. And much of my work over the past 20 years has been to decolonize and disrupt heteronormative assumptions in the bookrooms of the various schools I've been teaching. My work as an educator is supporting student voice and diversity. Wow, thank you so much, Annika. It's so nice to have you. And Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Reynolds. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And uh, I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Tecumlips de Sequetmec in BC's interior. I am a dedicated EDIDA advocate and I'm a learning and development advisor at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. I'm originally from Vancouver and I grew up in the land of the unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I taught English at an international school in Vancouver for 18 years and now, I collaborate with Thompson Rivers People and Culture team to design workplace learning initiatives for the university staff and faculty. I work closely with the EDI uh, and Indigenous education departments to promote learning and to raise awareness for university employees across campus. I'm also coming into this work as an ally. As I mentioned, I used to teach international students in an environment with a very structured curriculum. I didn't really know how to talk about important topics like sexism, racism, or homophobia in my classes because my textbook only covered things like ordering meals in a restaurant or taking the bus. My teacher training didn't really go beyond the basics. For example, over the years, I've had several 2S LGBTQIA plus students come out to me privately, but I really wasn't sure how to behave or respond when that happened. It was also pretty common for my students to experience discrimination from other students based on their race, sexual orientation, religion, or sometimes even disability. So it seemed that my students sought me out because they recognized that I was a safe person, but I feel like I often failed them because I was unprepared and I didn't really know how to advocate for them, which resources I could recommend or even how to speak to their concerns properly. And I just wanted so badly to do it right, but without the fundamental knowledge that I needed, I chose to do nothing rather than to do it incorrectly. So in this work, my drive comes from wanting to help other teachers and educators who are like I was then, well-meaning folks who want to make a difference, but who really lack the tools to do it effectively. Wow, thank you so much, Angela, and it's really nice to have you on the show. And our last contributor, Chris. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks for having us on the podcast. Um, my name is Chris, and my pronouns are he and they. Uh, I'm a non-invited settler currently situated on the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wyandotte peoples. I am a graduate of the MET program at UBC and currently working as an e-learning specialist at Humber College Libraries in Toronto, Ontario. Um, and I've been working in the post-secondary sector for just over eight years. In my role, I'm responsible for developing online instructional resources, coaching faculty with instructional design and the use of educational technology, and supporting digital fluency initiatives at our Idea Lab Makerspace. 
I definitely consider myself relatively new to engaging with the work of EDIDA in the context of teaching and learning, um, having really started to engage with this during my time in the MET program. Um, as a queer person myself, I've always been passionate about the issues that are impacting queer and racialized communities uh, and have been an advocate for this work in uh, many other domains. Um, having gone through Ontario secondary and post-secondary systems and now having worked in the post-secondary uh, sector for some time now, I'm acutely aware of the challenges and barriers that students are facing um, and the systematic change that really needs to happen. One of my goals entering the MET program was really to learn about the concrete tools and sustainable research-driven approaches that would enable me to support learners and advise teaching faculty on best practices when designing instruction through an EDIDA lens. Some of the ways that I achieve this is by promoting and practicing learner-centered approaches, for example, universal design for learning, first people's principles of learning, and culturally responsive pedagogy. And that has been an amazing opportunity to have done so, even more amazing to share and extend this work with the gracious funding provided by UBC's Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center. Thank you so much, Annika, Angela, and Chris, for identifying the lens from which you will be speaking today. We will delve deeper over the next 45 minutes to hour and unpack some of these points that you've made. Tamika. Chris, can you please speak to how this work started and how it has evolved over time? For sure, yeah. Uh, so the genesis of our current grant work really started uh, a few years ago in September of 2021. Uh, during a MET course uh, called ETEC 531 Curriculum Issues and Cultural and New Media Studies. In that course, there was a group assignment that was focused on conceptualizing and designing teaching materials that address critical social issue or gap within the curriculum through a new media lens. So there were many issues, pressing issues for us to choose from, uh, but the one that we were all drawn to was the matter of sexual identity and gender orientation, or what's called SOGI. Each of us were interested in this topic given our own personal and professional experiences and our goals to learn more and become better advocates for this issue within our work and our fields. Annika also came to this with the lens of having years of experience of addressing this work within the BC K-12 system and was really able to identify some pain points that uh, we thought would be useful for us to look at. And one of these pain points was a lack of available lesson planning or teaching resources for addressing SOGI within the new media, BC new media curriculum, as well as a lack of SOGI literacy resources for educators who were completely new to addressing this within their own classrooms. This led us to create our first set of digital learning artifacts, which included a training module for teachers and two ready-made student lessons. This was also accompanied by an instruction guide, a glossary of definitions, and a directory of resources and organizations for parents, students, and teachers. After the success of this project for ETEC 531 and really our shared passion for this work, three of us decided to take it to the next level and submitted a proposal for a MET directed study course. Here we embarked on the research of culturally responsive and critical pedagogies, EDIDA literature circles, and inclusive maker spaces, really with the goal of understanding how we can meaningfully extend this work and reach more teachers. From this came our concept for a website called Teaching Transformatively, which served as an all-in-one training resource and lesson repository for teachers from all levels, but primarily in grades 8 to 12, to engage SOGI and EDIDA literacy in an accessible way. That led us to where we are today with the Edith Lando grant work that we are currently engaged in. In 2022, we applied for Edith Lando funding that would enable us to publish this resource as an open educational repository where educators can submit their own lesson plans with us with the goal of reaching rural and remote educators. It was important for us in this iteration that the lessons intersect and address SOGI through an Indigenous lens, as well as by teaching about Two-Spirit Identity. Thank you so much, Chris. And I feel very honored to have seen this work from its initial state all the way to fruition and where it is today. And I think you were, it really helped me to understand this better, but more so it helped our listeners to understand the foundation to this work and where it has led all of you. Angela, to extend Chris's explanation of your work, can you explain the mission of this project and identify the themes and issues that it is addressing? Sure. 
So one thing that really resonated with me when I was in the MET program was how essential it is for us as educators to decolonize the work that we do and to foreground Indigenous peoples whenever possible. When we include a land acknowledgement, for example, uh, it comes first, you know, before you dive into the topic of a presentation or a course. As a non-Indigenous person myself, I do this to recognize that the Indigenous peoples were here on this land for millennia before the settlers came, and also as an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose land we reside on. In the same vein, we recognize the reordered acronym 2S LGBTQI+, rather than saying LGBTQIA 2S+, with the 2S at the end. 2S stands for Two Spirit, and that is an identity reserved for and unique to Indigenous cultures. So this change acknowledges that Indigenous peoples were the first to build communities that truly honored sexual and gender diversity. So that's why we prefer to use the version that places the 2S at the beginning of the acronym, where it can truly place first peoples first. And this, of course, ties into everything we're doing with our project. Our mission is to provide educators, particularly those in rural and remote communities, with critical and culturally sustaining tools and resources that are inclusive of the intersections of IPOC, which is Indigenous people, Black people, and people of color, and also 2S LGBTQIA plus people. Our work serves as a means to educate, support, and transform teaching, all while promoting equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization, and anti-racism. Our key themes are community, collaboration, and innovation. We are emphasizing place-conscious learning, sustainability, and strong ties to local communities and school districts. Thank you so much, Angela. That was really nicely said. And I think you unwrapped and unveiled um, an important key theme there in the 2S just through your explanation. I think it's something that um, really made it clear to our listeners and where we're going and how you frame the entire project. Now, Annika, to your knowledge, what is currently happening in schools across BC, in particular in rural and remote areas to support to us LGBTQIA plus staff and students? Well, while there's still a long way to go, we have certainly come a long way. And while I can't speak for all schools in BC, I can highlight the ways in which many BC educators are supporting our 2S LGBTQIA plus staff and students. Throughout the BC public school system, for example, every district has a SOGI team to support students and staff in learning and understanding all aspects of sexual orientation and gender identity. The intent here is to have a SOGI lead in every school. And I have to say my school has three SOGI leads, and so we're absolutely at the fore here. At the same time, there are GSAs and rainbow clubs in almost every school, and that's both high school and elementary, to support learning about SOGI sexual orientation and providing students with safety, a voice, and youth activism. One of the examples of some things that our GSA Rainbow Clubs are doing are rainbow crosswalks uh, throughout the schools to showcase uh, awareness campaigns and different kinds of things, everything to walking in pride parades. A grade 12 student currently in our district is planning a rainbow dance for queer students across our community to meet and network as their capstone project. And our teachers and librarians are standing up against book banning and championing diverse books with many different kinds of campaigns. Now, if I compare the school culture, resources, texts taught at the beginning of my career back in 2004 to today, there have been drastic changes. This was all new in the early 2000s in education. And today, SOGI awareness can be considered a norm in that there are teams of educators supporting queer staff and youth all over. Districts are aligned with SOGI 123 and our SOGI team meet regularly to discuss issues, share ideas and resources, attend and run professional development seminars, and we're constantly spending time thinking about the ways in which we can support the rest of our staff in understanding and supporting all of our students. Uh, currently, we're hoping to provide more district-wide pro to support more teachers in learning about the ways in which they can support staff and our students and seeing themselves in the curriculum. I also noticed that students have a strong voice in this process. 
My GSA Rainbow Club, for example, would like to see more queer focused sexual education funding and different things. And these are things that we're able to then bring to admin and then bring to the district level. And these changes are continually happening and I couldn't be more happy to be a part of it. That sounds amazing. Great work. I'm excited actually to hear that. That's wonderful. So now a question for all of you, how does this work contribute to the work of anti-racism and what does this mean to allyship? Angela, let's start with you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to speak to the allyship component. As I mentioned, I'm an ally in this work. And I hope I can speak for the group when I say that we all signed on to this because we recognize that there is some important work to be done and that we're in a good position to begin some of that work. Each one of us is an outsider to one or more of the communities that we hope to serve. All three of us, for example, are white folks born in Canada and who are uninvited settlers on this land. And in my case, I'm also a cis woman. So that positions me squarely in outsider territory as someone working on a project that is aiming to decolonize curriculum, support anti-racism and challenge heteronormativity. And it can be really scary because I don't want to get it wrong. But being an ally means putting that all aside and just committing to learning. As an ally, you need to understand that you will probably or definitely make a few mistakes and you have to be open to continuous learning and to let people correct you when you mess up. If you're a person who has privilege, and I acknowledge that I do, it is important to use it to raise awareness and create meaningful change when you see people around you facing discrimination. So allyship to me means letting go of my ego and committing to becoming more self-aware and supporting people who need and deserve the support. That's wonderful and such an important point to recognize your perspective. So Chris, how about you? I mean, I really align with everything Angela just said, and I can also think about the mandate of our project, which really seeks to achieve the work of anti-racism by providing educators with the, the basic knowledge, the tools and materials that they themselves need to become active participants in this work, uh, as well as to us LGBTQIA plus allyship. And we do this in a few ways. One of this is by providing primers on different terms and definitions. We also provide ready-made lessons, as well as training on critical pedagogies, makerspaces, and literature circles. And by doing so, we hope that educators can develop confidence with, with navigating these topics within the classroom and, and start to cultivate a safe environment that really values learners at the intersections of those identities. Thank you, Chris. That's really important. And Annika, do you have anything to add? Absolutely. This is why we sought to include intersectional voices throughout the resource in our toolkit. One of the members of my first GSA group, Joshua Whitehead from Peguas First Nation, is now a poet, novelist, and assistant professor at the University of Calgary, writing about two-spirit and indigenous queerness. His current work involves curating collections on Indigenous futurisms, texts I teach in my English First Peoples 11 classes, and include on the unit plans on our website. This literature movement rooted in the context of science fiction and fantasy confronts past and present colonial ramifications. It transforms indigenous knowledge bases and imagines ways to heal and build a better future for indigenous communities and beyond 21st century culture. Whitehead's work also centers 2S and indigenous queer protagonists, supporting youth in seeing themselves in literature, in the curriculum, and in the future. Teaching this literature is important as it helps us critique the exclusion of Indigenous peoples in science fiction and mainstream media, and recognize the strengths of First People cultural practices and beliefs, and the role they play in developing the future. In Whitehead's introduction to, quote, Love After the End, an anthology of two-spirit and indigenous queer speculative fiction, he expresses that rather than focusing on the dystopian, this project, quote, queered toward the utopian as an important political shift in thinking about the transporalities, the temporalities of two-spirited, queer, trans, and non-binary Indigenous ways of being, end quote. He continues to note that, quote, Indigenous queerness has always signaled fatalism in the eyes of colonial powers, primarily the white gaze, and from the directed killings of 2S, peoples during Western expansion through the contemporary erasure and appropriations of the term two-spirit by settler queer cultures who idealize, mysticize, and romanticize these histories. I think bringing his texts and ideas into the classroom and engaging in these powerful discussions are only some of the ways in which our work contributes to anti-racism and allyship. 
Thank you so much to all of you. I think you've really first started with understanding your own identity and understanding how you're situating yourself within this practice and within this work, but more so to be responsive and to be adaptive and to be sensitive in the work that you're doing. And secondly, to draw in the works of others who are representative within this environment, within these communities. And to be allies in that space, I think is really important and what is needed. And that's why I'm so happy that you have created such extensive resources to put in the hands of educators, because this is not there, this is not available. And so being able to do so in a very culturally responsive way really lends itself to this day and age, what is needed, what is missing, those gaps, those pieces. And I think you're, you're filling the gaps really nicely. So along those lines, another question for all of you is how will your work support educators? Anna, can we start with you on this one? Absolutely. As part of our grant work with the Edith Lando Center, I've been developing unit and lesson plans to support educators and bringing these diverse works into the classroom. On our website, I've developed a resource outlining how to approach literature circles for EDIDA. Now, Lawson, I was reading 2021, shares that, quote, literature can transform how students perceive human experiences when it enables students to see their lives and experiences as part of a broader human existence. Reading becomes a means of self affirmation. Classrooms should be places where all students can see themselves in books while developing literacy skills. So deciding on novels for literature circle sets can be challenging and time consuming. It can be especially challenging to know where to start with equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization, and anti-racism when faced with the classic canon staring at us from our departmental shelves. On our website, teachers will find a number of suggested literature circle sets for high school English studies courses grades 10 through to 12, um, by theme and genre to get them started thinking about how they can include Indigenous and 2SLGBTQIA plus voices and stories in their culturally responsive and inclusive classrooms. At the same time, right now, I'm developing one for grade nine. I've shared the units on Indigenous futurism that I've been teaching in my English First Peoples 11 class. Centered on literature circle model, I provide an overview of multiple Indigenous novels, many with two-spirited and in digi queer characters. Within the unit plan, teachers can find rationales for bringing these texts into the classroom, as well as ways to support students in thinking critically about these challenging topics. Wow, what a great toolkit. Now, Angela, are you able to add to that? Yeah, I think so. I think you can have really amazing, you know, resources like this, but what if you're a teacher who really wants to include these critical topics in their lessons, but who lacks that knowledge, you know, the background knowledge or direction to teach them. I think of myself when I was teaching youth and how there were often times that I wanted to educate myself before diving into a topic, especially one that could lead to discussions that I'm maybe not prepared to deal with, but, you know, talk about important things like anti-racism or SOGI. So that's why I am particularly happy with the first piece that I contributed to our project back in 2021. It's a, a sexual orientation and gender identity digital learning resource, which I originally designed for secondary school teachers. I chose to use a paint palette design with seven globs of paint that represent the seven colors of the rainbow. And then each one opens into a distinct lesson when you click on it. It's got sex assigned at birth, gender and gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, pronouns, transgender, and the spectrum model. I tried to make it really user-friendly. So in addition to explaining the meaning of the 2S LGBTQIA plus acronym, for example, it also reassures teachers by reminding them that there are many terms for sexuality and it's okay to feel overwhelmed, but by learning these ones today, you are well on your way to becoming a better educator and mentor. And it really can be overwhelming at times. I mean, even since we made that resource, some of the vocabulary has shifted. Anyway, each of the lessons in the paint palette has a guiding question, definitions, and critical reflective questions that a teacher may ask themselves, as well as some links to additional resources on the topic. And my hope in creating this is that teachers who, like me, felt unprepared to jump in might have something that could be like a, a crash course or a primer. 
And ideally, they could use this tool to begin some important conversations, first with themselves, and then later maybe have some of those conversations in their classes. I wish this was available when I was teaching in the classroom, because I think it really does help guide people and give them a foundation and a starting point on which to go. Tamika. Thank you, Carrie. Within your discussion of your project, do you speak to the transformative work that takes place? Chris, would you be able to expand on this notion of transformative teaching and what type of pedagogical approaches might teachers implement when teaching transformatively? Yeah, for sure. Well, transformative teaching to us really means teaching in a way that invites students to consider new perspectives while at the same time empowering them to affect positive change in the world. So we approach this notion of transformative teaching in a few different ways by looking at some of the different theories and methods that are currently out there in the literature, uh, as well as actionable strategies and lesson plans, as well as engaging the community. At the heart of transformative teaching is the development of critical thinking and systems level awareness of the various perspectives and structures at play in our day-to-day -day lives. By developing an awareness of how each of these systems and structures operate, students can form new connections and hopefully become empowered to challenge the many injustices we see in the world, while hopefully moving us towards a society that is more inclusive and equitable. We explore transformative teaching by introducing teachers to the concept of critical digital pedagogy, uh, as well as culturally responsive pedagogy and two-eyed seeing. So this is a multi-part self-paced module where teachers can learn about the background of each pedagogy, identify examples of them in practice, and then reflect on how they could approach these within their own context. We also model transformative teaching by sharing teaching and learning strategies that are scalable and adaptable for a variety of contexts. Um, so this includes looking at examples of no, low, and high-tech makerspaces through a decolonized lens, as well as guiding educators on creating uh, their own makerspace using on-hand resources. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, another looks at how teachers can launch literature circles that center Indigenous and Soji perspectives uh, while using educational technology to facilitate critical investigations such as visible thinking routines and online discussions. Lastly, our, our resource seeks to extend the conversation around transformative teaching by inviting teachers to share their own lesson plans to our open repository, as well as provide an affinity space where teachers can discuss, share their own experiences, and learn from each other. We hope by being transparent about our own experiences creating this resource, we can inspire curiosity, accountability, and innovation in other educators who are ready and willing to engage with this work. That sounds really wonderful because everybody's going to be making mistakes or be feeling a little bit anxious or, you know, and by talking to other teachers, that's a way to, to learn. Now you mentioned two-eyed seeing and for our listeners who don't understand that term, could you explain that a little bit further, please? Yeah. I mean, the notion behind two-eyed seeing is really looking at things from the, the westernized lens uh, so like a eurocentric lens which has been situated within education as well as an indigenous lens so it's really considering those two perspectives thank you thank you very much that will be helpful for our listeners for those people who've never heard that term before now this is a question again to all of you and you've spoken a little bit about the impact of this work on your particular practice and I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more about this and the impact on your work and your practice, but then also the practice of others. Angela, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so I started a new job about 10 months ago, and I'm pretty sure I was able to land that job in large part because of the important work that Annika, Chris and I are doing with this project. I can't believe how much it has already helped me in the role. For example, my first task at work, my first, first, first task was to create a new accessible and inclusive onboarding e-learning course for new employees at the university. So exciting. And I learned a lot. And I also designed a training for hiring managers, which, of course, includes a section on anti-bias and creating more equitable interviewing and hiring practices. I'm currently working on a mandatory sexualized violence prevention and response training for faculty and staff, as well as courses on bullying, discrimination, and intersectionality, among others. So this work really impacts 
everything I do in my role. And as the campus learning and development advisor, I then have an impact on everyone who works at the university. It's an incredible feeling, to be honest. That is amazing. And I remember when you landed that job and how perfect you were for the role, but really how everything kind of layered as it was led to that time and that place. Now, Chris, what about you? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I'll say as an outsider to teaching in the K-12 sector or area, I've really learned so much through this project by discovering the various points of needs for, for secondary school educators that will enable them to foster equitable, affirming, and inclusive learning environments. It's also been an opportunity for me to learn more about some of the pedagogical and andragogical work being done that can help us to authentically engage learners in a meaningful way also been invaluable for me to take on and consider how this fits in within the, the work of the post-secondary sector where I currently work in, where I coach faculty in instructional design approaches, you know, for example, using UDL, accessible learning, and inclusive pedagogy. Fantastic. And it's really nice to hear those fundamental frameworks and pedagogies are being used and being taught. Now, Annika, how about you? Yes, working on this project from its inception back in our new media course to today has helped bring to the fore of my teaching practice the importance of diverse curricula. While I've always been an advocate for diverse books and ensuring students see themselves in the curriculum, in the past I rarely moved beyond the walls of my own classroom. Through this work I've connected with so many other educators sharing our website and our resources. In the middle of this project I changed schools. And at a time when a new course was being introduced, English First Peoples 11, specifically at the school I was about to teach at. Now, because of my literature circle work and diverse novel research, I was able to purchase so many new novel sets to support my new team in running this course. It was a wonderful time uh, to spend a lot of money and bring works by Joshua Whitehead, David A. Robertson, Ivan Coyote, Sherry Dimeline, Leanne Benamasaki Simpson, Ian Ross, and Jordan Abel, and I could keep going into the classroom. And this has really enriched the discussions and extended the point of view from which we can examine the human experience, that which is at the heart of literature studies. I've also found that I am constantly researching Indigenous and queer authors and artists, which exposes me to new and exciting texts to explore. It's really hard to believe that this all stemmed from a course project with you, Carrie, just a few years ago. It is amazing how far it has come, but how important this work is. This really is so fascinating. Now, Angela, where is this work headed? What does the future hold for the project and for this work? Well, the next step for our Teaching Transformatively project will be to open uh, our resource up to collaboration with educators and teachers in an online affinity space. We're going to launch a call to action feature and, as we mentioned, a resource repository, which will provide teachers and students in rural communities with foundational tools to support culturally sustaining pedagogy. Our goal is to provide crucial resources to underserved communities to help fill gaps that may exist there. These resources are culturally sustaining, and we hope they will help to restructure educational opportunities for learners across Canada and maybe beyond. Most of what we offer can be implemented as is, or downloaded, shared, remixed, and maybe even reshared in our EDIDA hub and lesson repository. We haven't just built a teacher and educator toolkit, but an entirely new online educational community that is holistic, safe, and inclusive in its design. It's unclear exactly where this project will go from here, but who knows, we might even be open to recording some training sessions to share online in the future. I love that idea. And this truly has become a participatory learning ecology and culture. Annika, how about with your work? Um, As Angela mentioned about training sessions in the future, I'm currently developing a Pro-D workshop session that I hope to share during the BC teleconference in October. That's for teachers of English language arts. This session will center the diverse literature circles, visible thinking strategies with first people's ways of knowing and intersectionality at the fore. This session will center diverse literature circles and visible thinking strategies with first people's ways of knowing this learner-centered model is a cornerstone of teaching transformatively. Our intent through this workshop is to support teachers in bringing these diverse authors into the classroom, 
allowing student choice and providing opportunities for student voice as we dig into challenging but important discussion topics. The visible thinking strategies are effective routines to support these kinds of discussions. Through these workshops, uh, we hope to include various aspects of our resource, such as our for educators section and introduce our call to action to really give weight to and momentum to our learning repository. This may also extend to future workshop presentations during Tapestry Conference in Victoria next spring. That is fantastic. And I presented at that conference last year, and it, that would be a really great place to share this work. Thank you so much, everyone. Tamika. So, Chris, based on the work that you've done and the intersectionalities that come into play, what suggestions do you have for others who identify as part of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community, as well as the IBPOC community, in ways to support educators and students who are trying to navigate their own cultural knowledge and identity, who might not have the role models or those that they could turn to for guidance or advice? Yeah, thanks for the question. So look, it's a big question. <laughs> I think it really speaks to the importance of the role that educators have and the need for providing those affirming spaces that really provide learners a sense of safety and belonging. I feel like most educators do already recognize that there are systemic uh, social barriers that exist uh, and that there is an absence of safety and affirmation that's not afforded to queer and racialized youth in those spaces. Unfortunately, a lot of these barriers, you know, for example, government policy that is prohibiting the use of gender affirming pronouns are not within the control of educators. And this unfortunately has become a highly politicized issue in many parts of Canada and has really put queer and trans youth in schools across Canada at risk uh, and in a position where they don't feel safe to engage with their identity. As such, right now, it's not easy for teachers who want to create these safe spaces for their students but at the same time feel like they have their hands tied I, like i'm not a teacher myself so i can't say for certain what the right answer is here uh, given these restrictions that are being imposed through policy i mean perhaps my, my colleagues here might have a better answer but my hope is that some of the strategies that we are addressing in our toolkits can provide educators starting points uh, and a way for them to center and acknowledge the experiences of learners but that they do feel seen and heard. I would also suggest that those individuals um, working in education uh, work together to champion inclusive spaces wherever possible. You know, one way of doing this can be cultivating a support network and sharing best practices to, to mentor or and support students. One thing that we're trying or hoping to do, at least in the future, is perhaps creating an email list where folks can seek advice and share support. So kind of like a listserv in, in a way. And then depending on your context, I would also say uh, research your local community organizations that are doing a lot of work around this already and can provide resources and wellness supports for 2S LGBTQIA plus and IBPOC youth at risk. So for example, there's a community in Vancouver and in Toronto, there's the 519. Thank you so much. We actually had a podcast last year or the year before with the director of community, Alex, and incredible, incredible supportive work that they're doing and going out into schools and laying the grassroots of this type of work as they continue. So thank you, Chris. We really appreciate all the incredible resources that you shared and amazing ideas. And for listening audiences, all the resources that were shared by Angela, by Chris, by Annika, as our show progresses, we will be making these available to you through hyperlinks and attachments to this podcast. So rest assured, all of these amazing resources will be shared with you. But at this point, Annika, what has been your yes, your favorite absolute finally moment for you when considering the impact, the work that you have done on anti-racism in 2S LGBTQIA plus communities and outside communities? Can you share that with us? Yes. So there have been many yes moments throughout this project. Since I began working in the school district last fall, I've been using Angela's interactive paint palette in meetings with our SOGI team, with my GSA Rainbow Club, as a resource to support parents, and one-on-one -on -one with teachers who weren't sure what each of the letters stood for. It has really proven to be a useful tool. At the same time that this work has helped me share with educators, it has impacted the students in and out of my classroom. I've been able to teach all the lessons in our resource to my students over the past few years and reflect on the impact the lessons have had on the students' critical thinking. 
A lesson that particularly comes to mind is one that I designed in response to Met's anti-racism series Call to Action um, on worldview and historic trauma because of the powerful impact it had on the depth of discussion in my classroom. Specifically, we examine the role point of view plays in the construction of our worldview and how that impacts the way we understand stories, people, and culture. By beginning the lesson in a circle with an object in the middle in which students can only see one side, we can experience the Mi'kmaq notion of etwatmak, or two-eyed seeing, as Chris referred to earlier, and the significance of the circle in First People's ways of knowing to reflect on the importance of seeing all sides of something, sharing what we see from our vantage points and how we can understand each other better when we share what we see, what we know, and what we understand, rather than only coming at something from a single perspective. We then drew connections between Adichie's TED Talk, The Dangers of a Single Story, and Rebecca Thomas's spoken word poem with that same name, Etuat Monk or Two-Eyed Seeing. Students were able to then apply this learning when exploring the Indigenous principles of peoplehood, two-eyed seeing, as I mentioned, and the circle through First Peoples' lived experiences and stories to learn about the impact of past experiences on the present. Uh, this was particularly apparent when we focused on the representation of indigeneity and social issues in the video game Terra Nova by Maze Longboat. This indigenous made game provides more than just representation and inclusion of indigenous characters. As a cooperative game, it works to educate through interaction, using both narrative and play as a form of activism around race, gender, and the impact of colonization. Terra Nova invites players to explore Earth and what Indigenous and settlers' first contact would look like a thousand years in the future. Players share a keyboard and explore the respective environments of Terra, an elder of Earth, and Nova, a space-born youth on a split screen. Now, what's really powerful was the discussion that followed. Students made insightful connections between the ideas in Thomas's poem, Adichie's TED Talk, and the interaction in the video game. At the same time, my students were inspired to create a second level for the video game as it ends quite abruptly, feeling more like a prologue than a fully formed game. In small groups, all my students ideated their versions of the next level, thinking about the power of interactivity to teach players about the natural world, relationships, the need for cooperation, exploring decolonization as gameplay. Because students were taking part in the action, both as players and game designers, they were able to really make a change. Now, what really stands out is I can remember some of the comments students made, and I'll quote them. It's like we can rethink what it should have been like when Columbus found Turtle Island. Another one, I like that both characters need each other in order to survive the landscape and move forward. Another student said, in our version, the characters are going to teach each other, other about the parts of their culture. And probably my favorite comment was, I'm going to make this level on unity over the winter break. And of course the student did, and I couldn't be more proud of them. So like, these are the moments educators relish when students are able to make connections between the ideas and lessons and texts, both to their own lives and society as a whole. That's really wonderful, Annika. I, I can just, in my mind, I can see the kids <laughs> playing and working on that, uh, that game. That's excellent. So can you tell us from the yes moment that you just spoke about the work that you're doing now to support anti-racism in the 2S LGBTQIA plus community, what might this support look like from an educational technology lens? Absolutely. Digital storytelling, such as through the video game Terra Nova that I mentioned earlier, can have a powerful impact on learning as both player and maker. This is because games and digital stories don't just tell people something. Readers become players, taking an active role in the story making process. As a designer, we're thinking of the many different layers, moving beyond the quote single story to affect change and impact our audience. From design thinking to computational thinking, we are building multi literacies in our students. Through immersive action and role play, we can explore stories much more deeply. This provides an intimacy between the reader and player and the text. There's like an agreement between the reader and the author that the text will do something and that the reader must actively engage with the text to make it do what the author promises. 
So through e-literature tool exploration from Twine to Unity, um, I've experimented with quite a few platforms for novice e-writers. Uh, and the ones that I've used successfully with my students are Twine. Uh, and this is for, you know, you choose your own adventure style storytelling. Um, I use this with students in response to the interactive text Downtown Browns, which was based on our provocation in our Makerspace workshop at the Met Conference last year. I've also used Genially with students for interactive images, escape room style game design. Uh, recently, I've played with Storium with my students for collaborative card-based role-playing story writing. And this was really an excellent way for my grade nines to explore story structure in a collaborative digital setting. Um, and Microsoft Make Code Arcade. This is a block a JavaScript editor that uh, is open source and allows for both that low ceiling block coding, but also high ceiling JavaScript and Python coding to build and practice computational thinking. So these interactive digital storytelling allows readers to step into another's perspective, inspire conversations about racism, discrimination, power, privilege, and self-determination by combining social justice sensitivities and experiences. Combining this with like visible thinking routines, such as the step in, step out, and step back, helps students think about another person's feelings and beliefs, what they need to learn to understand that person's perspective better, and then what they notice about their own perspective and what it means to take on somebody else's. These are creative tools for conversations around racism and its intersection with 2SLGBTQIA plus discrimination. Thank you for that, Annika. You know, I think it's powerful to step into someone else's viewpoint. And thanks for bringing that up. I, I mean, that sparks so many thoughts, hopefully so many conversations from our listeners. I think I'm going to borrow that, actually. I'm in the midst of uh, continuing to plan for the VR, AR, XR Summer Institute. And I think I'm going to take the step in, step out, step back approach to this because we do a lot of perspective viewing within a virtual reality environment. So thank you for that one. These are really some amazing ideas and a great inclusion of educational technology. So thank you to Annika, to Angela, and to Chris. And a huge Question to all of you, and how do you view educational technologies and what recommendations? You've already given several, but what additional recommendations might you have for our listeners? I just wanted to say, like, Annika, like, I, I've heard you talk about, you know, this work that you've been doing, but, like, also hearing again is, like, it's just so awesome. Um, just really cool to hear about, and I'm so inspired by what you do with your students. But with that said, like, I think, you know, coming from my where I am at right now in the post-secondary sector, something that I think about when approaching technology, um, is that it's really important to embrace ed tech um, as a way to enhance learning where, wherever possible. And the reason for that is that I think it can be a powerful tool to support student digital fluency. I think it's also important to maintain a critical lens when using technology um, and considering who developed the tools, who's their intended audience, and what kind of biases uh, do they inherently possess. Um, and we really, you know, we can think about that right now with generative AI, it's all kind of changed the landscape of education over the last two years. So understanding the extent of these biases and the and the kind of information that, you know, they're taking from students is essential for ensuring that we have equitable and effective um, educational environments. In addition to that, I also think it's important that we remember that technology should support our practices rather than dictate them. It's important that we use our technology to be flexible and adaptable to the unique needs of our learners, uh, rather than it being used in a prescriptive, one-size-fits-all manner. Thank you so much, Chris. Angela, do you have anything to add? Well, I feel like kind of the newbie coming into all of this, I mean, not anymore, obviously, it's been a while, but when I started the MET program, I didn't really know anything about technology at all, <laughs> or tools or whatnot. So. I think my advice and what's been working for me would be just to always push yourself and look for new opportunities and new tools to use. When I was a student in MET, there were many times when we were assigned the project and then asked to try to use a tool you've never used before. And it was like, ah, you know, it's so frustrating to try and learn all the the ins and outs of a tool. But then you start realizing like, wow, a lot of these work together. Or they're similar, you know. But it, it was really hard as a, a brand new student after 20 years of not being in school, because in my previous role, my previous job, we couldn't use any technology in our classrooms at all. 
We had one computer in the classroom, but it was only used to take attendance and to enter test scores. And that was basically it, maybe the odd email. So like I had never even used PowerPoint, you know, like total novice. So whereas in the MET program, like I said, I had the opportunity to try out a lot of new and new to me different learning technologies regularly. And it was super frustrating. But now I'm using similar tech and some of the exact same tech in my role all the time to create e-learning programs for the university. So it's amazing. One thing I did when I was in MET also was I signed up to present at the Tech Expo. My presentation was on the ways that algorithmic bias can amplify injustice, especially based on race, like with things like facial recognition software. But while I was at the expo, I also learned about using a bunch of other cool technologies from the other presenters. So not only did I do that research and learn quite a bit myself, but it was enriching just because I could look around and see what everyone else was up to. But probably, and Carrie, you know all about this, the coolest thing I did and also probably the most challenging was to take the Summer Inclusive Makerspace Institute. I learned so much that I was able to include in our toolkit. During the course, I learned ways to utilize a maker mindset to tackle issues of equity in the classroom. For example, you can take a provocative photograph or a video or something that shines a light on an important issue like racism or homophobia, and then ask your students to create something using educational technologies as a call to action. They might make a stop motion piece or design a t-shirt or a poster or create a digital story like Annika mentioned before as a way to make a statement and to encourage others to do something at a grassroots level to address a problem that they see in their communities. So now our toolkit has a pretty extensive resource for teachers who want to learn more about using makerspace principles in their classrooms. So thank you, Carrie, for that. You are most welcome, and I'm really, really happy to see that it's being utilized so much and that learning has expanded. And really, you've taken so much farther than I would have ever expected, which is absolutely incredible. Thank you. Tamika. Thank you, Carrie. So there are certainly many ways to utilize educational technologies to fight the fight and evoke change. To continue, Chris, do you have any advice for educators on how they might be effectively implementing anti-racist discourse in their classrooms? And how might this be achieved through educational technology? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do think that, yes, there are many ways that educators can be implementing uh, anti-racist discourse within their classrooms uh, and supported uh, by the use of ed tech. And we can really start by looking at the goals of anti-racist discourse, which is to challenge and decenter the dominant white Eurocentric heterosexual perspectives and, and shift that towards recognizing equity deserving historically underrepresented perspectives uh, within our curricula. Doing so ensures that our equity deserving equity owed learners feel valued, respected and seen. And when that happens, they can feel supported and empowered to achieve their learning goals. Um, when we fail to act and when we ignore the perspectives and experiences of these learners, we risk alienating them and really reproducing those systems of harm that have long been and continue to be perpetuated by educational institutions. I'll also add that another goal of anti-racist discourse is to also cultivate uh, critical thinking skills, empathy, and understanding about those systems of harm that have long been in place and continues to be a divisive issues in many years. So for, you know, how do we approach this? Um, educators should first begin by critically evaluating their learning materials, lessons, and tools, you know, to kind of do an inventory and take time to consider whose perspectives are being represented um, and whose perspectives are being left out. They can then consider different ed tech frameworks and approaches that support the goal of anti-racist discourse. Uh, so one example is uh, Universal Design for Learning or UDL, which is, you know, a very popular framework. UDL, uh, for instance, teaches us to use full means of representation and provide multimodal entry points to freely available texts and resources such as books, articles, oral histories, videos, podcasts, speeches, artwork, and so on. In her book, Anti-Racism and Universal Design, uh, Dr. Andrew Tesha Fitzgerald suggests that providing multiple entry points or 
on ramps, quote unquote, that are varied and inclusive of racialized perspectives can be a powerful means of promoting engagement and motivation. And it does this by activating prior knowledge and creating those new cognitive connections. Uh, UDL also suggests that we uh, offer multiple opportunities for action and expression. There are times where traditional modes of assessment, such as exams or written essays, are necessary. However, they need not be the only way for students to demonstrate their learning. We can now design, through the use of EdTech, process-based assessments that allow learners to express their knowledge in a more authentic and personalized way. For example, we can look at platforms like Microsoft Flip or Padlet uh, to facilitate online discussions, uh, which enable learners to express themselves using their choice of written text or audio or video. Uh, another approach could be using a collaborative mind mapping tool like Miro to design a visible thinking routine uh, where learners can express themselves in a visual way. By enabling students to use technology in these ways to personalize their learning and convey their knowledge, we can empower them to express their unique cultural perspectives and to reclaim and take up space where they've been historically excluded. So we recommend that teachers take a look at some of the resources that we've included in our Teaching Transformatively Toolkit if they're unsure of where to start. Alternatively, teachers can also speak with their school or college university librarian uh, or seek out curated open educational resources and lesson plans online. We recognize that not all teachers have the agency to make this type of change within their curriculum or course materials, um, but perhaps there are small ways that they can change their approach to be more inclusive. So to that end, we encourage teachers to experiment and be open to utilizing educational technology within their context. And we really feel like these approaches can really lend themselves to more student-centered inquiry-based learning and intercultural discovery really can be a powerful tool uh, towards anti-racist discourse. That's wonderful. I I really like the idea of having communities that are underrepresented being represented in the learning materials that are being used and in the technologies that are being used. And that's a stepping stone to empathy and understanding. So thank you for that, Chris. Now, as we start to wrap things up, Angela, I have a question for you. Good intentions are just the beginning. But there is a huge gap between what we intend and what we actually do. So what are your suggestions to educators to help empower them to have essential conversations with their students to ensure the nuance and depth of anti-racist and anti-2SLGBTQIA plus discourse is given what it deserves in order to elicit that type of change? Mm, big question. It is. I, yeah, it really is. Um, I hope I can do it justice. I think one of the most important parts, at least for me, is starting by educating myself. You should try to take every workshop, every professional development, every course that is available to you so that you can have those important conversations and to deeply understand the issues and the gaps that exist. As I said before, when I was a teacher, I didn't really understand how to promote racial equity even though I was working with international students. I thought the best way to deal with racism was to just shy away from all conversations that dealt with race. And I was definitely not comfortable discussing 2SLGBTQIA plus topics either. So that's why I wanted to help educators like me to be better allies. So I guess my advice would be, if your workplace doesn't have literature or other important resources that support equity, See if there are ways that you can become involved in the decision making process and bring in stories and materials that do represent all learners, because every student needs and deserves to see themselves in the curriculum. And whenever possible, try to collaborate with other teachers or educators. You know, if you find a great resource, share it, you know, amplify the reach. I think collaborating with other teachers really would have helped me to be more confident, confident enough to have conversations in class that could really elicit change rather than just pretending those problems didn't exist. I think that will give a lot of teachers courage. So some additional thoughts to end. What should we have asked you that we didn't? Is there anything we missed? I would like to, you know, to let folks know how to access our, our resource, um, which is coming soon. Um, we're hoping to have we're, we're in the process of preparing our call to action, and we're hoping to have this live um, by June. 
I believe. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so folks can access our resource uh, at the link uh, teachingtransformatively.ca. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Carrie, all of these resources that you have mentioned, we are going to ensure that everything's shared. And you mentioned a lot of really great educational technology tools. So we'll make sure that those are all hyperlinked as well. So that people, if when they're listening, they can say, oh, you know, Miro, I've never tried that before. I'd like to try that. And so everything will be available to people, just accessible in that link. And to that note, I would like to thank our absolutely incredible guests and it's been such a pleasure to have my former students on the show um, and this podcast so annika angela and chris thank you so much for your thoughtful impactful responses that address what you have named as teaching transformatively culturally sustaining pedagogy i think just within this entire podcast and how you've presented everything with all of the ideas your clear examples from your own perspectives, from your own experiences, and then also suggested educational technologies to propel learning and discourse and change forward has been amazing. You've helped us unpack anti-racism in two SLGBTQIA plus communities in a very clear and dynamic way, and you provided us with a lot of food for thought and best practice strategies through the use of educational technology to inspire change both in education and beyond. And to all our listeners, as mentioned prior to the presentation, the intention of the speaker series is to eradicate racism through small and large steps towards change. And as such, we have created a call to action to move the teachings and learnings from today's podcast session forward. Tamika. Thanks, Carrie. So we challenge every listener of today's podcast to participate in one act of change. This could be having a conversation with a neighbor or colleague about something that resonated with you from today's podcast, or it could be creating an interactivity on anti-racism with the inclusion of 2SLGBTQIA plus voices to share with your students, colleagues, peers, or staff. You might create a subset presentation or podcast to react to the discussion on transformative teaching for 2SLGBTQIA plus communities to draw awareness to the issue. We ask that you continue the conversation by sharing what you will do to implement the content from today's session into your personal and or professional life using the hashtag MET and hashtag UBC Anti-Racism. When it comes to the availability of impactful, culturally sensitive and relevant lesson plans that address anti-racism, there are very limited resources available. We heard about some new ones today. But we are urging as a grander gesture for any interested listeners of today's session to submit a lesson plan that aligns with the content from our interview with Annika Nussbaum and Angela Reynolds and Chris Rugo with your curriculum in an attempt to create good quality anti-racism resources to put in the hands of educators. This lesson plan call to action can be found on the MET website using the URL provided in the comment area, and we'll do that. Here, you'll find a lesson plan template and submission criteria. Some lesson plans will be chosen to be published on the MET website and may receive a grant offered by Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center to create additional digital resources which support your lesson plan. All lesson plan entries, including grades K-12, to post-secondary, and graduate studies are encouraged and welcomed. As quoted by Nelson Mandela, Education is the powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. We are asking you to help with this change. No act is too small. Carrie. Thank you, Tomika. And one last thank you to our guests today, Annika, Chris, and Angela. It has been absolutely such a pleasure. We're so happy to have had you today. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much for having us. This is really this is great.